This is a keyed bugle, a now outdated ancestor of the brass family of band instruments. I'm standing on the steps of the birthplace of John Philip Sousa. What do the two have in common? We're going to find out as we explore the history of bands in America. The history and tradition of bands in America, especially brass bands, is a long, rich, and colorful one. For many years, bands have had a special place not only in the musical life of the United States, but also in the everyday life of the American people. Standing here in Washington, D.C., at the birthplace of America's most famous bandsman, John Philip Sousa, I can feel that sense of history and tradition. But most people don't realize that there's much more to this history than just Sousa himself. Since the early 1800s, in small towns and large cities, Americans have had the desire to strike up the band. Bands have played for just about every possible occasion. Aside from concerts, bands are as much a part of the military as guns. They've been heard at political rallies and presidential inaugurations ice skating rinks and town meetings, fairs and funerals, festivals of every size and description, sporting events. Ship launchings and circuses. When a train pulled into the station with a celebrity, who led the cheers? A band. When Henry Ford manufactured his 20 millionth car, how did he celebrate? With a band. When Americans wanted to dance, what did they use? A band. And of course, what's a parade without, well, you know. Both amateur and professional, bands have serenaded and marched Americans through the years. Band history has been influenced by many things. But the two greatest influences have been the development of instruments and the many uses that people have found for bands. Let's take a look at how all of this happened. When you think of a brass band, you probably think of a scene like this one. The flashy uniforms, the bright brass horns, and the rousing music played outdoors. You might be surprised to learn that your great-grandparents thought of brass bands in much the same way. Although the details have changed over time, many of the same things were in the 1890s as they are today. But bands and band concerts haven't always looked like this. In the late 1700s, just after the time of the American Revolution, the typical band consisted of only six or eight players. The core of these early bands were pairs of oboes or clarinets, horns, and bassoons. These groups were called harmony, and the music that they played was called harmony musique. The instruments were very difficult to play. They had awkward fingering systems, and the mechanisms for changing from one note to the next weren't always reliable. Because they were handcrafted, the instruments were also expensive. As a result, most of the few bandsmen of the period were professional musicians. 
even by the year 1800, there were no town or school bands. To see and hear an authentic harmony band, we've come to a registered National Historic Landmark, Gadsby's Tavern Museum in Old Town Alexandria, just outside of Washington, D.C. In the late 1700s, Gadsby's Tavern was a place for travelers to spend the night and have a meal, and a place for local residents to gather. The ballroom at Gadsby's has seen many events, and this is where we find the Tacoma Chamber Ensemble performing harmony music of Franz Josef Haydn on instruments that are authentic recreations of original oboes, horns, and bassoons of the late 1700s. Clarinets and oboes played the melody in the harmony band, but these woodwind instruments were very limited in two ways. First, they were too soft to play a melody that could be heard over long distances outside. And second, they were too delicate to withstand changes in the weather. Now, the natural trumpets and horns, the brass instruments of the harmony band, were certainly loud enough, and they were very durable, but they didn't have any vowels, and so they couldn't very well play a melody. Now, bandsmen of the early 19th century were well aware of these limitations in their instruments, and one of them decided to do something about it. His name was Joseph Halliday. He was an Irishman, and he gave his fellow bandsmen the thing that they'd been waiting for, a brass instrument that could carry a tune. His invention was called the keyed bugle. Like the instruments of the harmony band, the keyed bugle was handmade, expensive, and hard to play by today's standards. But it was a musical breakthrough of sorts. It was introduced to Americans around 1815. For a number of years, the keyed bugle was used successfully both as a solo instrument and as a delightful new voice in the traditional wind band. But it was so effective, especially in outdoor settings, that bandmasters began thinking very different thoughts. Why not have a band made up entirely of brass instruments? So, the Boston Brass Band was formed in 1835. Many other groups followed, joining in a growing national trend. In the 1840s, a number of European musical instrument makers invented a series of valve systems, systems which replaced the keys on the key bugle and made brass instruments much easier to play. The instruments were more durable, and many more people could learn how to play these inexpensive instruments. With this invention, the brass band movement was launched.
When America's Civil War broke out in 1861, bandsmen were ready. It was a musical war. There were plenty of popular patriotic songs at the time, and band music had a prominent place during the conflict. Bands played for many occasions, recruitment rallies, troop farewells, serenades in the camps, and even, on occasion, during battles. To some, the regimental bandsmen seemed a nuisance, but to many others, the music of the bands was a lifesaver. It relieved their loneliness and boredom. One volunteer from Massachusetts wrote home to his wife, I don't know what we would have done without our band. And many others agree. Ford's Theater in Washington has been the site of many performances and plays, but on the evening of April 14, 1865, it was the location of an event that changed American history. While seated in the presidential box watching a play, America's 16th president, Abraham Lincoln, was shot and killed by an assassin, John Wilkes Booth. Today, Ford's lives on as an historic landmark and theater. It's here that we've come to hear authentic Civil War era brass and percussion instruments. As you'll see, two styles of brass instruments are used. The over-the-shoulder kind developed for bandsmen who marched in front of groups and the now traditional bell front. Pitched higher than modern brass, these instruments produce both bright and mellow sounds. Here is Heritage Americana conducted by Robert Garofalo performing the Grand March Maggie by my side.
Some bandsmen didn't return from the Civil War, but many of those who did kept on playing in bands. By the year 1900, the brass band movement had spread to every corner of the land. They played for weddings and funerals, picnics and parties, and of course for concerts and the All-American Fourth of July Parade. At the peak of the movement, around 1910, there were more than 40,000 bands with perhaps a million active American bandsmen. Why were there so many bands? Many people supported bands because they were the only way to provide instrumental music for social and civic occasions. In the 19th century, there was no radio, no phonograph, no recorded music of any kind. If you wanted music for listening or for dancing, you wanted a band. And in addition, most people agreed that a band reflected well on a community. As one person put it in the 19th century, to be without one was to be dumb, backwards, and uncivilized. Every segment of the population formed bands. There were black bands, such as the Universal Band of Newark, New Jersey, Thornton's Knights of Pythias Concert Band of Memphis, Tennessee, and the Alabama Orphan School Band of 1909. There were Native American bands. Females, who weren't usually allowed to play in the men's groups, formed their own bands. These ladies called themselves the Aida Brass Quartet. And while the band movement was primarily an adult activity, there were family bands, such as the Noss Family Band of 1890, the Stroll Family Band of Pottstown, Pennsylvania in the 1880s, and the Shepherd Family Band, who believed in teaching the children early. And there were all children's bands. Cowboys played in bands, as did mechanics, firemen, and newsboys. Many companies, from serial producers to typewriter manufacturers, sponsored bands for their employees. By the 1870s, there was an army of amateur bandsmen for whom music was, for the most part, an enjoyable and inspiring hobby. But there were also more and more professional bands. These bandsmen earned a living playing music, often in outdoor band concerts during the summer and for indoor dances during the winter. Some of these groups were so accomplished and so popular that they were able to make national tours and play to sell out audiences. Naturally, the soloists and band leaders of these organizations gained a certain amount of personal recognition, and some became musical superstars of their day. There were great cornet players, such as Alessandro Liberati and Herbert Clark, and great soloists who became band masters, such as Frederick Innes, Arthur Pryor, and Helen May Butler. But of all of these early professional bandsmen, none had the mystique and the sustained popularity of the great Patrick Gilmore. Gilmore was an Irish cornetist of great skill who served as a Civil War bandmaster. To celebrate the end of the war, Gilmore, ever a showman, organized several enormous musical events. The first was held in Boston in 1869. This extravaganza featured 1,000 instrumentalists and 10,000 singers. The concert was so huge that a special concert hall had to be constructed to hold it. There were even live sound effects added, such as 100 firemen banging on anvils and cannons. However, besides being very flamboyant, Gilmore and his band were also very good. Gilmore reintroduced woodwinds to the brass band making what is considered today to be the first critically acclaimed touring concert band. When Gilmore died in 1892, it was hard to see how anyone could fill his shoes, but someone did. In fact, 
that someone ultimately filled Gilmore's shoes so perfectly that now, when most people think of American band music, the only name that comes to mind is his. I'm speaking, of course, of John Philip Sousa. Sousa was born in Washington, D.C. in 1854 of immigrant parents. With musical training and talent on a variety of instruments, he became an apprentice musician with the U.S. Marine Corps Band at the age of 13. By the age of 20, Sousa was a violinist and conductor in several theater orchestras. In 1880, at the age of only 25, he was asked to become the conductor of the Marine Band. He accepted and brought this ensemble to a high musical standard. In 1892, Sousa was to begin a 39-year tradition of musical excellence with the formation of his own fully professional concert band, which bore his name. During that time, the Sousa band crisscrossed the United States playing thousands of concerts for countless numbers of people of all ages. A gentleman who enjoyed composing music, horseback riding, and trap shooting Sousa wrote 136 marches, 15 operettas, 70 songs, and wrote or arranged over 400 other types of musical selections, many of which were featured on his own concert programs. Sousa took his band on four European tours and one world tour. When Sousa came to town, it was a big event. Banks closed, the schools closed for the matinee, because uh, here was uh, the March King, a man known throughout the world as the March King came to town. It was a big event. When you get right down to it, uh, we must not think of him just as a composer or as a famous bandmaster or as a, a writer of operettas. He was an entertainer. He appealed to people. What was it like to play in the Sousa Band? Robert Mayer should know. He played oboe in the band on the tour of 1930. When we would enter the a town and we had a private train of course we had three always had three coaches and a baggage car uh, mr Sousa would get off first and there would uh, if there were a band meeting us and that band would be either a members of the of the high school group or local local bands community bands and such and he would conduct them in a march and for some reason or other they always said that they sounded better when the old man was up there with his stick he also had a feeling of lending confidence to a person in his playing. It was his confidence in himself and his confidence in his players that has to be exuded to an audience. And of course, they all loved him.
always, of course, the Stars and Stripes. Every concert ended as an encore with Stars and Stripes. In the two and three times a day that I played that in the one year that I was with him, why, it was always a thrill that sent chills up and down my back every time we played it, whether it was morning or the afternoon or the evening. And for a 19-year-old kid, well, that was an experience, and that's just what I was when I, when I played with, with the old man.